Hi everyone, um, my name is Alicia Kral. Uh, I actually received my um, PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison doing research on citizen science and invasive species. And I started that program around 2006. Um, and a lot of, there's been a pretty big significant rise in citizen science since I started that project a little over 10 years ago. So I was going to provide a little bit of information on where the field of citizen science currently is. And I was also going to talk a little bit um, about some of the benefits and challenges of um, using citizen science as a tool. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on invasive species just because that's kind of the area that I did a lot of my research in. Um, but I'm also going to talk about some other areas as well, just to kind of give everyone a little bit of a um, broad view of, of where we are. So I wanted to start off with a little bit of a history. Um, so what is citizen science? I'm sure many of you um, know the definition, but I just kind of wanted to provide that up front. It's a partnership between scientists and the public to address research questions of common interest. And as I mentioned, there has been a huge rise in the number of programs um, over the past few years. But it's important to note that citizen science has actually been around for a very, very long time. Science wasn't actually a profession until the late um, 20th century or 19th century, I'm sorry. And so um, before you, know, you could actually get a degree in science, um, most of the science that was done was done by amateurs. Um, Thomas Jefferson, um, back in the day, even had an idea of where he was wanting every county to start collecting temperature measurements twice a day and also wind direction. And he was pri primarily trying to address a rumor <laughs> um, in uh, Britain that the weather wasn't as nice in the U.S. as, <laughs> as it was there. So he was trying to uh, disprove um, um, those uh, rumors, I guess, that were spreading. But it's just kind of interesting. You know, you can read a lot about um, Thomas Jefferson's involvement in citizen science and even um, Henry David Thoreau. There's a lot of information out there. So I encourage you guys, if, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the history, um, to kind of look, in, look into that. So as I mentioned before, um, pretty much over the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, there's just been a huge rise in citizen science and the types of projects that are out there. A lot of this um, rise has mainly been involved with um, uh, the internet. So basically a lot of people are able to communicate, share their data um, a lot more efficiently than they were able to um, before the internet was around. Um, this is just basically showing you the number of peer-reviewed publications that have been coming out um, that primarily address citizen science. And as you can see, um, this goes up to 2012. It's actually, if I extended it beyond, you'd probably see even a greater rise. But there's just been a lot more um, publications coming out from all of the work that you as volunteers are doing in this area. Um, in 2012, it was pretty notable. Um, the first ever citizen science special issue came out in Frontiers in Ecology and Environment, and that's a um, pretty prestigious ecology journal. Um, and at the same time, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology um, released its first book on citizen science of, in that same year. Um, shortly around that time, there was a um, conference on the public participation in scientific research. It actually occurred with the Ecological Society of America conference. And from that, um, basically, the Citizen Science Association was formed. Um, the Citizen Science Association is basically um, a professional society that basically pulls everyone together to kind of share best practices and um, talk about the future direction of, of citizen science as a field. Since the Citizen Science was, Association was created in the US, um, there's also been a European Citizen Science Association that's been created and an Australian Citizen Science Association. So this has happened pretty much between 2012, 2014. Um, also, uh, that's pretty significant. Um, science, which is kind of the top journal um, within the scientific community um, came out with a couple of uh, publications in 2014 on citizen science. So again, you started seeing this kind of gradual um, interest within the broader scientific community and utilizing citizen science. Um, but in, uh, I believe it was 2013, 
um, the Citizen Science Association actually created a journal. Um, it's all open access. Uh, so if you're interested in reading any of the articles in, um, in that journal, you can, but it's called Citizen Science Theory and Practice. Um, there was another conference that happened in 2015. And at that time, they decided to start having um, conferences every other year. So there's actually going to be one in two weeks. Um, some of you may even be attending it. Um, it's going to be in the um, Twin Cities in Minnesota. Um, so again, this is the Citizen Science Association's second conference, and they're hoping to have them um, every other year. And if you're interested in joining the community, um, you can join um, as a volunteer um, as well. So again, just kind of wanted to give you guys just a little bit of an introduction of how the field's just been growing really rapidly. Um, over the past several years. Um, so another area I wanted to talk a little bit about is the impacts of citizen science and um, basically how it's really contributed to um, scientific research. Um, this is an image. Um, some of this research was work that I did when I was doing my dissertation work um, in Wisconsin. But the two um, images of the state on the left side are showing you data that were collected by professionals in the field. So the um, top left is showing you um, locations of marsh thistle in the state, and the bottom left is showing you um, data points of um, Japanese knotweed that was collected by professionals in the state. If you look on the right side, we're adding additional um, data collection points from volunteers in the field. So you can see with marsh thistle, you're getting a few more points further south um, and a little bit more west. And then if you look at Japanese knotweed, <laughs> you can see that there are a ton more data points uh, for this species. And one of the reasons for this with Japanese knotweed um, is that the data on the left were just the data that had been collected by professional efforts. But on the right, um, the Rivers Alliance of Wisconsin um, had started uh, to get their volunteers out collecting um, sightings of this species. And that's where you see a pretty significant growth and um, where we knew the species to exist in the state. Um, we then sent these data to the USGS. Um, and they basically use these data to help develop models so that we can predict future spread of the species. So again, both of the maps on the left side are from professional data sets and the ones on the right are from volunteers and professionals. And if you look at the left um, top, which is again marsh thistle, the darker areas are showing you um, areas of high probability of that species um, spreading. And on the right side, you can see that there's, because there was more data involved in this prediction, you're actually seeing some additional areas that were once considered not to be very susceptible or actually showing to be susceptible. And then when you look at the bottom, um, again, with Japanese knotweed, for the data that was provided by professionals, there were only four or five data points. So this predictive map is pretty much um, just useless. It's really not providing you with any information. But if you look at the one on the right where we added the data that was collected by um, the volunteers, you're actually getting a much better picture um, of where Japanese knotweed is likely to spread and where it's going to be likely to cause more of a problem in the state. Um, another way that volunteers are really contributing um, to research is through crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing basically just refers to the process of outsourcing, outsourcing tasks to a distributed group of people. So as an example, I wanted to talk to you about a project that I was recently involved with um, working with NEON. But there is an online um, website. It's called Zooniverse.org. And Zooniverse basically got started um, by astronomers at Oxford University that had all these images that had been collected from the Hubble telescope that they did not have enough time um, to process those images to determine what um, the pictures were actually showing. Um, so they actually uploaded all of these pictures into the site, the Zooniverse, and had volunteers get on the site and start helping them classify these images. And they basically, that project was so successful, they've been starting to expand it into other areas. 
So the project that I was specifically working, and again, it's, it's part of the Zooniverse. There's multiple projects on there currently. Um, but the one that I was uh, working on is called Season Spotter. And basically, um, we have these cameras set up all across the country, and they take images um, about every 30 minutes. And those images are supposed to pick up changes of when um, leaves are um, coming out, when um, things are blooming, um, that kind of information. And similar to the Hubble telescope, we had all these images that we didn't have time to classify. But the Zooniverse now consists of over 3 million volunteers across the world. Um, so we uploaded all these images. We wanted to try to get um, 9,500 images classified within a few months. We were able to get them all classified in under 24 hours. Um, so again, just to show you the impact of having all of these people from all across the world, even if they just classified one or two images, when you have that many people working together, it can really make a huge impact. And I wanted to mention, um, since all of you are volunteers in Wisconsin, there is a Wisconsin um, project on the Zooniverse. Um, if you want to check it out, it's um, at zooniverse.org. And um, it's basically showing you images taken by wildlife camera traps throughout the state. So that may be something you guys would be interested in checking out as well. Um, another thing I wanted to um, just let you guys know, this group called The Crowd in the Cloud um, just last month released um, four episodes on citizen science. And it's just a really good way for you to get a good idea of all the impact citizen science is making and, and not just environmental sciences, but also um, medical research um, and a lot of other areas. So I just wanted to let you guys know, you can actually stream all four episodes um, that were shown on PBS. If you just go to this website, crowdandcloud.org and you'll see all of them um, that are available and each one is an hour long. So I just wanted to let you guys know about that in case you're interested. Um, so I kind of wanted to shift a little bit and talk about some of the benefits of um, participating in citizen science um, to the volunteers. Um, so there's kind of um, this spectrum of different types of citizen science. So on the left, that's kind of what a lot of people think of when they think of citizen science. You have a scientist, um, they come up with this research idea, and then they basically ask a large group of people to help um, work with them to address this, this idea that they have or this research question. But there's been another type of citizen science that's really getting a lot more attention um, that's more bottom up, where um, the researcher's not determining the research question, um, but the volunteers are actually coming up with the research questions that are of interest to them personally. And then um, they collaborate with researchers, natural resource managers, nonprofits, um, and basically all work together so that they can address this issue. So um, I guess it's been about a year ago, I served as the director of the Virginia Master Naturalist for a few years. So I wanted to provide you an example of this top, um, uh, or sorry, bottom up citizen science, an example from the Virginia program. Um, but there was a, a um, area of land in Virginia that was owned by the Nature Conservancy um, of uh, um, longleaf pine. There was basically a rare fire-dependent pine savanna that was habitat to the red cockaded woodpecker, which is currently an endangered species. And Japanese stiltgrass started to come into this area, and it was basically altering the fire um, regime of the area. Um, because it added a lot more fuel to that system, it caused the fires to be more intense and hotter, and so it was starting to damage some of the um, vegetation. And this is just giving you um, an image of what this um, system looked like prior to the invasion, and this is showing you what it looks like um, with the Japanese stiltgrass coming in. So some of the volunteers with the Virginia Master Naturalist Program realized that was, this was a pretty significant problem. So they started talking to the manager um, of the Nature Conservancy property and then started talking with some professors um, at Virginia Tech. And they decided that what they were gonna do was go into the area and basically map um, everywhere that they could find Japanese um, or sorry, yeah, Japanese stilt grass within this area. So they basically covered the entire area. Once they had it mapped, 
they started testing um, different treatment regimes for the Japanese stiltgrass in the system. So they basically set up several experimental plots and they, um, again, working with the scientists and the, nat um, the re resource managers were able to actually do some research on the species. And I left before this project has ended, so I can't give you the results of what they found, um, but they're continuing to work on this project. So again, it's just a really good example of how um, this was driven um, by the interest of the volunteers versus the interest of the, the researchers specifically. Um, and I mentioned before that I did um, my dissertation research uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I also looked at how participation in an invasive species citizen science program might impact um, people's attitudes or behavior, and also looked at science literacy. And we basically did this as a follow-up to a study that they did um, at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, looking at similar things for folks that had participated in the Birdhouse Network project that was hosted by the lab. Um, so we primarily wanted to see if we, you know, kind of saw similar um, results from participation in the projects that we had developed. And um, this graph is basically just showing you um, that the, the um, citizen science program that we developed focused on um, teaching people about invasive species, global positioning systems, and also vegetation monitoring. And the Cornell lab study focused specifically on bird biology, but all studies basically showed a significant increase in people's understanding or knowledge of um, the things that were being studied as part of the citizen science project. Um, this is kind of a detailed graph. You don't need to look at all the details of this, but um, basically there's some metrics that are used in surveys to look at um, any changes in people's attitudes towards the environment. And basically from the study that we created and this, um, the study that we did and the study that they did at Cornell, we basically found that um, the people that were participating in these citizen science projects they're, you know, environmentally focused, tended to have stronger attitudes towards the environment um, than just the general population, which may not be surprising. But something else we wanted to look at um, was any sort of changes in people's um, science literacy, you know, by participating in the scientific process. And um, there's a, a study that the um, government does every year that basically just tries to gauge science literacy across the American public. And they ask a question, tell us in your own words what it means to study something scientifically. Um, the line at the bottom of this graph is basically showing you the percentage of the U.S. population that was able to provide a uh, a pretty decent response to that question. And as you can see, um, that's pretty low. Um, the triangles near the top center, that was the same question that was asked of the folks participating in the Cornell study. And then on the far right, that's basically showing you the percentage that answered that correctly um, for the people that participated in our invasive species study. But the thing that I wanted to mention here is we actually didn't see any sort of change in people's ability to answer this question before and after they participated in the project. Um, but again, this is kind of a generic question. When we asked um, um, science literacy questions that were specific to what um, we were teaching in our training, so invasive species specific science literacy questions, we actually did see a significant increase in people's ability um, to basically develop a research question and be able to provide a great answer for how to respond to that research question. So that was pretty interesting. Um, so um, moving forward in terms of improving citizen science, um, a lot of folks, um, especially within the scientific community, you don't hear this as much anymore, but near the beginning, there were a lot of concerns about data quality with volunteers collecting um, data. So how do we know that they're collecting data um, adequately to be used in a research study? So I have this little um, cartoon here, Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> um, so Calvin's saying, I'm filling out a reader survey for Chewing Magazine. They asked how much money I spend on gum each week, so I wrote $500. For my age, I put 43. And when they asked what my favorite flavor is, I wrote garlic curly. 
Curry, sorry. And then um, Hobbs says, this magazine should have some amusing ads soon. And then Calvin says, I love messing with data. But that kind of gets at what that concern is, right? If, you, if we have all these people out there collecting data and they're putting the data in incorrectly and research are using that data to, you know, basically um, develop hypotheses and look in tr at trends, um, if those data are incorrect, they're going to basically um, do, make analyses and conclusions about things that actually aren't occurring. But I just wanted to let um, all of you know there's actually been a ton of research going into um, data quality associated with citizen science specifically pretty much to address these concerns. And I'm just going to go um, through a, a few examples. Um, but David Delaney did a um, project um, on the New England coast. It was published in Biological Invasions, and he was basically using volunteers to identify um, an Asian shore crab. And what he did is he basically gave the training to a, a bunch of different individuals and basically collect some information um, to find out if there were any um, traits associated uh, with um, people uh, and their ability to um, collect data uh, of good quality. And so he basically found this information that over 80% accuracy was found for third graders and 95% accuracy for seventh graders when looking at species differentiation. And then that exceeded 80% for seventh graders um, looking at um, gender. So it was basically being able to look at this protocol and determining um, what sort of eligibility criteria, criteria might need to be established to ensure that the um, Data is a good quality. But something interesting too about this study is that a fifth grader um, identified a range expansion, expansion for this um, species and found it 60 kilometers northeast um, of previously recorded locations. Here's just another example. Uh, many of you may be familiar with eBird. Um, they actually have developed an online data validation process that as you enter um, information into eBird, if it's outside of the parameters they've defined as being normal, um, it'll just go into the system. But if it's outside of that range of um, normality, you'll actually get a, um, get a pop-up that's like, are you sure that's what you saw? <laughs> um, and you can say yes, or you're like, no, I, I'm actually not sure. But if you say yes, it'll then go into the system um, and it'll go in for expert review. So they basically have this automated data checking service um, associated with eBird, which is, which is really cool. And this is a, um, a paper that you can also access online if you're interested. And from one of the studies that we did um, with our volunteers in Wisconsin, we just asked people how comfortable they were identifying a species. And we actually saw a strong correlation between how comfortable they were and how well they could identify the species, um, which may make sense. Um, but it is, it's just it's a pretty interesting finding that a lot of folks hadn't thought of before. But there's numerous publications, 40 publications came out in 2013 alone that was just looking at protocols that have been tested in the field. And there's also been a lot of data coming out um, basically by statisticians that are um, doing some analyses on citizen science data. So I just wanted to wrap up um, giving you guys some tools that you may not be aware of and you may be interested in looking at um, as you are, you know, doing um, citizen science or have interest in um, citizen science projects. Um, Sitsci.org is basically a website that allows you to build custom data sheets. So a lot of citizen science projects have developed their own protocols and they have online data entry forms specific to the protocols they've developed. But this is a really good resource for those bottom up projects that I mentioned before that you may not have the resources to create your online data management system, but this allows you um, to create one yourself. Um, so that might be a valuable resource to some of you. Um, Extension has a, a website called Citizen Science Resources for Cooperative Extension. If you just Google that, um, you'll find this information. And I'll be sure to give this presentation to Anne if anyone um, wants to follow up on some of these things. Um, I know there's a Master Naturalist training program now in Wisconsin. Um, the Virginia program has developed a series of lessons and training information on citizen science. Um, so if you're interested in accessing any of those, um, I can um, provide you with that information. 
um, citizenscience.gov. It was actually created to help support um, government agencies uh, doing citizen science projects. Um, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has provided some tools for evaluating citizen science projects. There's a nice user's guide for that. And then um, SciStarter.com. This is basically a database of citizen science projects, global citizen science projects. So if you're interested in finding a project related to a specific activity or something you're interested in for different grade levels, um, pretty much anything that you would need, um, that's a really great resource um, if you're interested. Um, so with that, I am going to end my presentation. Um, I have my email address here. Uh, I actually serve as the managing editor for that SciStarter. Um, they have a blog network on citizen science. Um, so if you want to reach out to me, you can um, reach me at alicia at SciStarter.com.